Obviously, Bracky's left, but his game jam didn't leave, so naturally, I participated this year. If you didn't already know, in the Bracky's game jam, we get a week to make a game that follows the theme. This time, the theme was Stronger Together. So I started by breaking on a whiteboard and just jotting down all the ideas that I could think of. The first thing that came to my mind was a platformer where you control two players at the same time. But see, one of the categories the games are ranked on is innovation, and I was pretty sure that that was probably the first idea that came to everybody's mind. So I scrapped that and decided to make a skydiving game. Yeah, I know you've the title so bear with me for a second. I figured I'd take inspiration from this game I used to play called Wii Sports Resort. In the skydiving minigame you jump off a plane and take selfies with other people who jumped off that same plane. It fits pretty well with the theme because when you take selfies with other skydivers together you get more points which makes you stronger. So I got to work with the goal of implementing the basic game loop but after about maybe two or three hours I realized this idea was way too big in scope and I'd either not finish a game or I'd end up with a super scuffed end product which I didn't really want. So with the day almost gone, I decided to completely restart from scratch. Anyway, going back to the whiteboard, I decided to make an isometric puzzle game where you're a water droplet who combines to make bigger water droplets and splits to form smaller ones. I picked an isometric art style for the game because I've just been practicing art on my own lately and I found that I really really like drawing isometric vector art. Plus, literally every indie game is either made with pixel art or low poly models. And it's not like that's a bad thing, but like I said before, one of the categories is innovation and I want to innovate. My process for making isometric art is actually pretty simple and straightforward. I use Adobe Illustrator, but this can be done with a lot of other art programs, I'm sure. I start by using the grid tool to, well, make a grid. I then rotate it 45 degrees and scale it down on the y-axis by 57.74%. I'm not really sure where that number comes from, so if you know, please let me know in the comments. And when you have the grid set up, you can pretty much just follow the grid lines to create cool isometric shapes. I went through this exact process to draw this ground tile, which looks pretty cool. The colors I used came from a color palette I found on low spec. I mean, it even has Nate in the name, so I was pretty much obligated to use it. When that was all done, I set up an isometric tile map in Unity and got some rest. The next day hit me like you're about to do to the subscribe button. I started the day by drawing an isometric cube in Illustrator which would function as the player for now. I intended to replace it with a water droplet but just never got around to it. When that was done, I figured I'd learn something new because, well, that's what game gems are for. So I did a quick google search on Unity's new input system, and I came across this tutorial which explains it all really well. I'll leave a link to it in the description and I'd really recommend you watch it. When I was done with the tutorial, I went off to go implement it into my game. And because I'm an incredibly smart human being, it took me 3 hours to realize that I had hadn't actually enabled the inputs in my script, which would explain why my inputs weren't being registered. Next, I made some isometric grid movement, and the way it works is actually pretty simple. I start by passing in a directional vector, which is normally the player's input. I'll use the example of 0, 1, which is the equivalent of the player pressing the W or up arrow keys. I then use four if statements to figure out if it's left, right, up, or down. I then change that to fit an isometric perspective. As an example, up or forward is half a grid cell right and half a grid cell up, and right is half a grid cell right and half a grid cell down. And after adding in a jumping animation made with Dootween, it looks really cool. Oh, and I forgot to mention, if you want to learn from my source code, I have a GitHub repo for the game linked in the description. Next, I hopped back into Illustrator and drew this spike, which is really just a cone, but I'm calling it a spike. I then drew a smaller version of the player and brought that all into the game. If you hadn't already picked up on it, two smaller players get spawned in when the big player gets split, which transitions very well over to my next task, which is to make splitting and combining. The split Splitting is the easy part. I start by checking if the player is overlapping with a spike, and if they are, I instantiate two new copies of the player but smaller, and I destroy the original one. The combining is where it gets a little more difficult. Each player has a component attached which will check if it's overlapping with another player. And from there, I just spawn a bigger player and destroy the two original smaller ones. But see, I had to find a way to figure out which player would be the one to spawn the bigger one. Because otherwise, both will just spawn the bigger player and I'll have two copies of the bigger player which I don't really want. So the first method I tried was comparing their X positions to see which one is bigger, and whichever one was bigger would be responsible for spawning the bigger copy of the player. Now, this method will work 99.99999% of the time, but see, if their positions happen to be exactly equal, then no player will get spawned and the game will break. And because my movement is snapped to a grid, this is very possible. So I looked into some other methods and eventually found out that the UnityEngine.Object class has this method called getInstanceID, and this is exactly what I needed because the integer it returns 
returns is guaranteed to be unique. All I have to do is check which player's instance ID is greater and then have that one spawn the new bigger player. And now it all works pretty well. But I had worked a lot that day and it was getting late so I decided to go to bed. It's day 3 and my code's at a state right now where it's not really maintainable. Now, normally I'd kind of be okay with this during a game jam, but there's features I want to add that I can't because of this. So I of course spent most of the day doing a massive refactor. Rider is my preferred IDE and has so many cool little shortcuts that make this process so much quicker than say if I was using Visual Studio. And when I finished all that, I was able to make this little animation for when the player tries to go somewhere they're not allowed to. The only example for this right now is trying to go off the map, but see that's kind of boring so I decided to fix that problem. I went to Illustrator and drew some blue and green grass. And now the green player can't go on the blue grass and the blue player can't go on the green grass, which I think will make for a lot of interesting puzzles. And with that, the day was finished, so I went to sleep. On day 4, I decided to make my main focus polishing the game. I began by making some camera shake. In the past, I've made my own, but this time I used Dootween's transform.doshake position function. Anyway, I figured I wanted the player's movement to have a lot of impact, so I made camera shake pretty much everywhere. And I showed it to some friends and they said it was way too much. So I toned it down a lot and now it doesn't feel like a maraca, which is pretty cool. Next I made this isometric ball in Illustrator, which I used to make particles for when the player splits and combines. And finally, the player needed a way to win. So I drew this ground tile in Illustrator and used contrasted colors to draw attention to it. And when I put it into the game, it looked good, but not quite good enough. So I made some particles and it looks a lot nicer now. And when that was done, I was done, so I went to bed. It's day 5, and today I decided to work on some menus and UI. I started by drawing this restart button in Illustrator and then adding it into the game. All it's doing is calling a method on my scene manager script, which will restart the level. I then wrote a script that implements these two interfaces to detect if the mouse is over the game object or not. And if it is, I use doTween to tween the scale of the object. So now, we get this, which is cool. When that was done, I created this move counter UI which will keep track of the player's moves. This looked good, but I decided to make it look even better by using Dootween's do shake position and do shake rotation functions to shake the number when you run out of moves. I then slapped together this main menu and decided to get some rest. In the morning, I showed the main menu off to some friends and they all said it was ugly. So to fix that, I made it not ugly. More specifically, I made a clipping mask with the winning ground tile and the text. And after that, I made a song in FL Studio and recorded some sounds with my microphone and Adobe Audition. Then, I decided to save levels for the last day because I'm just that smart. It's day 7 and the jam ends at 6am tomorrow. Restarting after the first day really put me behind so I still had to make all the levels and fix a ton of bugs. But lucky for me, I was able to finish 7 levels in the span of about 3 hours. I then went on to fix some bugs and made Mac and Windows builds for the game. I really wanted to make a web build but the game kept crashing in the browser whenever I did a scene transition which was pretty bad. I sent the Mac build to my friend and he gave me a lot of good feedback. First, he said it wasn't obvious enough when you win because it looks the exact same as restarting. So I added in some particles which fixed that issue. And the second thing he said was that he thought there should be more feedback for when you try to go somewhere you're not allowed to. So I used Dootween to tween the weight of a post-processing volume with a chromatic aberration effect on it whenever an event was invoked, which gives us this cool glitch effect thing. And with that, I had a finished game, so I submitted to Itch about 9 hours before the jam was finished. I'm really happy with how my game turned out. And because I enjoyed working on this so much, I'm going to be working on it post-jam with the intent of releasing it on Apple and Android, which also means that I'll be posting weekly devlogs, so stay tuned for that. And at the time of recording, the jam's rating period is still going on, so if you want to rate my game, I'd be more than appreciative. And yeah, hit like if you like, also hit like if you dislike, and please subscribe. And yeah, have a great day.